we, we heard it directly from the president, but uh, his tweets this morning suggest uh, week's not going well. Can you give us some color around it? Well, I think as you heard him say that uh, China has reported its worst economic growth since 1982. And uh, the reality is what we see is, is manufacturing jobs uh, fleeing China. Some are returning back to the United States because of our regulatory agenda and our tax cut agenda, but some of it's going to other parts of, of Asia. And so the president feels that we have leverage at the moment in negotiations with China. I think for a long time there's been an assumption from previous administrations that if you actually have trade with China, it'll lead to other freedoms inside the nation. And that has not proven true to date. China has remained a communist nation that, uh, that abuses human rights. And, um, and the reality is that uh, there's a lot of concerns we have about China on the national security front, too. And this president is looking to try to reset those relationships. And uh, we're hopeful that we can get a, a trade deal at the end of this. But, uh, but he recognizes that right now they need it more so than we do, he believes. Uh, last couple of days, the president's mentioned more and more this idea that the Chinese would wait out the election cycle here in the U.S. We often have to ask analysts if that's their base case, but is that your base case? I, I don't know that it's our base case, Carl. I do think that there is frustration that, uh, as you've heard the president say and Secretary Mnuchin say, that, that we felt we were about, uh, uh, we got into about the 10-yard line previously, and then we felt that there were several hardliners within China that pulled back um, because uh, some of the enforcement mechanisms they were unwilling to live with. And I think that's been a challenge in our relationship with China for some time, is that uh, when they strike deals, they've backtracked on, on a lot of areas where we've wanted to enforce the restrictions that we put in place that, that, that stop transfer of ownership, that stop the intellectual property theft, that would actually limit some of the subsidies that they provide in, in supporting it from a, from a essentially a communist economy. So. Uh, we've been frustrated that they pulled back from some of those enforcement mechanisms, but we're very sincere about wanting to make sure that those things are protected in future trade negotiations. Previous administrations have been unsuccessful in ensuring that they no longer steal intellectual property and that there are limits in the amount of subsidies that they can provide for competition with, our, with, our, with the companies here in the United States. So do you guys in the administration feel that this is a good campaign strategy? not to make a deal with China? In other words, there's this, there's this new feeling on Wall Street that the administration doesn't have any interest in making a deal because the base likes the China bashing and the tough attitude and the tough stance that you're talking about and the president's taking with regard to China. I don't think I view it that way. I think that in reality that a trade deal with China would probably boost uh, markets significantly, would probably, would probably benefit the president politically. I don't think he's looking at this through a political lens. He's looking to try to reset the relationship is what's best for the United States, not just for today, but for future years as well. So I would probably have a different viewpoint than that, Sarah, that, that in fact a trade deal would actually um, boost the markets and probably give the president more of a lift heading into 2020. Mark, uh, you've long been the White House's eyes and ears on the Hill. Uh, yesterday, Axios says that Mnuchin's privately been telling people that Pelosi's promised to vote on the USMCA by October. Uh, her office says that's patently false. Is it going to happen? We think it's going to happen this fall, Carl. We're disappointed it hasn't happened yet. The reality is that because of the budget cap deal, Congress is going to be in more this fall than they would have previously been. So it gives us more of an opportunity to complete it. The reality is that Speaker Pelosi will only bring it up for vote if she thinks it's in the best interest of her own members. And so if you look at where the vice president's been traveling the country, he's been traveling to states like Wisconsin and Democrat districts where the dairy product is, is greatly enhanced by this new deal. He's been traveling to Michigan to talk about the benefits of auto manufacturers workers. In fact, today he's in Ohio visiting a company that's doing a new groundbreaking. It's a Canadian company looking to build a plant in the United States for auto parts because of the auto part protections provided in USMCA. He'll also be traveling to districts like in southern New Mexico, uh, represented by a Democrat who needs to get this because of all the new gas and oil exploration there. So. If you look at what our strategy is, is actually to go into districts occupied by Democrats to convey this is needed for your own constituents. That's going to be the key to getting Nancy Pelosi to bring this up for a vote. We again think if it's brought up for a vote, we have the votes to pass it. The question is, will there be enough Democrats who ask Speaker Pelosi to say, I need this for my own district and my own constituents, and it's better than what the existing law of NAFTA is? Are you guys calculating an actual economic boost? if the USMCA does pass and a market boost? Is oh, that your ab expectation? Absolutely. I think that if you look at uh, what uh, data has been put out, 
uh, to date, studies show it would, it would boost GDP. It would also boost a number of jobs by tens of thousands. So, yes, we think it would. It would and also, I think, this, Sarah, this, go back to your other question about China. If we can get a trade deal completed through Congress with Mexico and Canada, it gives a lot more assurances that this administration is looking to complete these trade deals. And this is a template for what we can do with Japan, what we can do in Europe. And there's many more that I think isolate the challenges we have with China. Uh, Mark, your point about uh, business investment is key because it's now a negative drag on GDP for the first time in a couple of years. Despite the tax cut, everyone points to trade uncertainty. I mean, does the White House acknowledge that it is a drag in part because supply chain managers are nervous? Uh, you know, Carl, I don't, I don't know. I think you go back to 2017, 2018, it would be difficult to sort of keep that pace up because of the anti uh, we're pulling back on some of the regulatory restrictions that were put in place by the Obama years and the tax relief. Certainly, that created an incentive for a lot of that uh, those investments to be made in that immediate window. But we still think the economy remains very strong. You know, the uh, the CBO when we passed the uh, the tax cut projected 1.6 percent GDP growth over the 10-year window, and we're far surpassing that, and think we will continue to. And as I said, the vice president today, in fact, is in Ohio at a company that's foreign direct investment. It's a Canadian company building a plant in Ohio. So we think there's still plenty of opportunity for additional investment in the United States. Quickly, Mark, you know, we're on the eve of another Fed meeting and we continue to hear the president just slam the Fed for keeping interest rates too tight. And yet the data continues to come in strong. I don't know if you heard at the top of the hour, better consumer numbers, better housing numbers. P&G just had its best quarter. I mean, the, one of the biggest consumer companies in the world just had its best quarter in years. Yeah. So what is, is, is the president playing politics to having a scapegoat here, the Fed, for not having the kind of 3% annual growth that he promised? I, I think it's more of a disconnect that talks about what the Fed's mission should be. In our mind, the Fed should be focused on inflation, and there's not been evidence of inflation. We know that what happened throughout the 1970s, 80s, 90s was an adaptation to the Phillips curve and believing that when you began to see employment increase that necessarily inflation would follow so therefore the fed wanted to get ahead of that we're enjoying record numbers of unemployment at 3.7 percent the lowest in 50 years but there has not been inflation that's followed that and so we think the fed should be focused on the inflation part it's also a relative question sarah because you look at what's happened internationally and you know what's happened in europe is they've actually lowered their interest rates so significantly that relative ours is, is sort of out of whack so we think the Fed should be more focused on the inflation side of that than on the jobs part and leave fiscal policy to help fix the job situation and continue to keep the economy as strong as it is.